because the reason we're starting at an early hour um, is due to the various speakers in various places. We were trying to get speakers from various locations around the world, and Deb did a fantastic job of coming up with a, a scheme that allows us to do it. But that's the reason for the relatively early start, for one of them anyway. So we're actually, because of the time constraint, I'm not going to go around and have everybody introduce themselves because um, we're a little behind. But I just wanted to say we have quite a few folks um, who are sort of visiting and just wanted to say a couple of words about what this committee is. So this is the Committee on Seismology um, and Geodynamics. It's a, 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 a committee within the National Academy structure. And really the role of the committee, the committee is sponsored by various federal <coughs> agencies, the USGS, NSF, NASA, um, and DOE. Um, and the role of the committee, we have two meetings a year, and it's really to kind of highlight what are the ongoing challenges and opportunities um, within, our, within our discipline and sort of try and bring out some of those, those issues. And we typically have a one-day workshop like this. It's very strange speaking from the middle of the room here. <laughs> anyway, we typically have a one-day um, uh, workshop that's part of that meeting. And today's workshop is obviously on tectonic precursors. So again, I'm not going to do introductions because of the time constraint, but thank you to all of our speakers who come very assistantly, um, and welcome to those of you who come to listen in. It'll be a free, free discussion. Please don't hesitate when we have the questions and the discussion pieces. Everybody is equally welcome to ask questions and participate in the discussion. Please don't hesitate to do that. Okay, so to get us started, uh, we invited Emily Brodsky from UC Santa Cruz um, to come and give us something of an overview talk um, on this topic. So over to Emily. Okay. Oh, my cap. Not that long of a room, but look at that. One of them is a high school. It's for the room. Uh, I see. Yeah. Not really. Oh, while she's micing up. That is a very critical piece of information. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, so um, I've been given this title. I don't think I came up with this title myself of opportunities and challenges in studying precursory phenomena. And I added prior to earthquakes and eruptions, just to be a little clear. And um, it's a kind of strange title. It's a kind of strange workshop, right? Um, Bec oh, it's all, oh, okay, it's Matt's fault. Uh, why am I, oh, I have to use the clicker, that's, or not. There we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, and I think it's a particularly strange title because um, I think you all know the answer to this question, right? Right, everybody knows, can we predict earthquakes? Come on guys, all together. <laughs> Generally speaking, I think currently today, state-of-the-art technology, the answer is, thank you, everybody awake even without their coffee. Um, and, uh, Nonetheless, it is worth talking about things that happened before earthquakes. Because in fact, some things do happen before earthquakes. Um, we've known for a long time that there are certain phenomena that do happen before some earthquakes some of the time, um, most notably foreshocks. Um, for, and uh, war shocks are not a particularly rare occurrence. I think people who don't study earthquakes for a living, living don't really appreciate how common war shocks are. Something like, depending on how you do the statistics, and Morgan will probably clean this up later on today, but uh, something like 20 to 50% of main shocks have observable war shocks. Um, and, uh, the converse, though, is not true. Not um, just because you see an earthquake does not mean another big earthquake is coming. So a foreshock is generally identified in retrospect. You 
see the big earthquake and you go look beforehand, did some smaller earthquake happen beforehand? And the statistic there is something like 20 to 50% of earthquakes have some smaller earthquake beforehand. But if you take an earthquake and try to ask what's the likelihood that it is a foreshock, that is some bigger earthquakes coming later, the st statistics work out to be something like 5%. And so this makes foreshocks rather challenging to use in a predictive sense. Um, you would have to accept an awful lot of false alarms. Um, so this has been the state of knowledge for quite some time. What's changed? Why are you bothering having this workshop now? I hear it's all Matt's fault, but I think Matt actually was being motivated some, by some pretty genuine observations, most notably Tohoku. Uh, the Tohoku earthquake in 2011, this magnitude 9 earthquake, the giant tsunami, I think probably everybody's familiar with it, um, it really got people's attention. Uh, for a number of reasons, including its fairly spectacular foreshock sequence that uh, we will hear much more about later today. But uh, its most vigorous period was a few weeks before the uh, main shock, and it migrated spatially, and it also, um, and it was the kind of event that with 2020 hindsight, you might have thought that maybe we should have done something about it with 2020 hindsight. Uh, so it really begs the question, what makes four shocks in the first place, physically speaking? And uh, there are kind of two dominant ways of thinking about four shocks. One is that foreshocks are some sort of cascade phenomenon. That is that you have uh, some earthquake represented by the red circle, which makes a bunch of aftershocks of various sizes. The sizes are drawn at random from a magnitude distribution that is much more likely to be small than big, but has a non-zero probability of being big. And the, each of those aftershocks has more aftershocks, which has more aftershocks, which has more aftershocks. And so there is a small probability of any one of these aftershocks being bigger than the original main song. So this sort of cast, triggering cascade would suggest that um, the four shocks are in some sense actually causal and that there's nothing physically different about four shocks that compared to any other earthquakes, it's just a trigger and cascade. That's one way of thinking about four shocks and it's one physical possibility. And I would say actually prior to Tohoku, it was probably dominant in the field. Um, Tohoku really made people start thinking about four shocks a little differently and resurrecting some older ideas about four shocks. Because in addition to having the actual foreshock sequence, there was some evidence of a slow slip event that went with them. And so here's the other end member of how people think about foreshocks, that maybe foreshocks are being triggered by some slow gradual creep on the fault that then uh, triggers these earthquakes. And uh, Ito et al had some seafloor instrumentation out temporarily in a kind of campaign style mode. And um, it's, it's a pretty tenuous data set. I think everybody would agree with that, including uh, Yoshi Ito. Uh, but it can be interpreted to be, show that um, there was a slow slip event sort of in the uh, foreshock area and that would be consistent with some sort of migratory foreshock behavior that ultimately triggered the main shock. The reason, by the way, this data, I call it tenuous, is because although the instruments were very close to where the eventual main shock were, because they were temporary, um, there's not much of a baseline. And so it's kind of hard to know whether or not you have a genuine anomaly or not. 
we'll come back to that thought. All right, so that was Tohoku. Um, and so that was pretty interesting. We had these migratory, so the slow slip and the foreshock, so the foreshocks actually migrated in space, uh, which is shown here just in this kind of uh, latitude as a function of time until it hit the main shock. And then what happened three years later was something else, was the Iquique earthquake in northern Chile. Um, and the Kike earthquake also had a very, very vigorous foreshock sequence in March of 2014 that also migrated. And the thing is, um, there's a lot scientifically interesting about a Kike, which many people will be talking about today. But I also think there's something kind of scientifically societally interesting about a Kike, which is because we had all been looking at Tohoku so much, I think a lot of people were much more aware of this foreshock sequence in real time than we might otherwise have been. And seismologists around the world, us at Santa Cruz, and we were by no means the only ones, were kind of watching this thing in real time and saying, well, here's this big lock zone at which we um, think there might be an earthquake and we and look at it migrating, when's it gonna happen? And my understanding is in Chile, people were sufficiently concerned that they actually went out and spoke to the press and said, you know, we don't predict earthquakes, but this is an unusual event. And you now we should always be prepared for big earthquakes. And now's a pretty good time to be prepared. And that sort of message was sent out in real time prior to the big earthquake in, on April 1st, 2014. Now that's a very different place. And this turned out to be a magnitude 8.1 earthquake. So, I don't, I don't remember. This is the key case sequence cannot be well fit by that cascade model using usual earthquake parameters. I don't remember if the 6.7 is aftershock deficient, but overall the foreshock uh, sequence is more vigorous that you would have predicted actually from the earthquakes earlier in the sequence. Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. And the key K, of course, is even more interesting than that, which is the um, that, um, like Tohoku, there is also evidence of a slow slip component to this foreshock sequence. Here, the evidence comes from onshore instrumentation um, rather than seafloor instrumentation. And the onshore instrumentation has the advantage of being continuous, so the baseline is well defined, but has the disadvantage of being further away from the actual source of slip, right? Because it's onshore, not under the water. And so, um, I think Sergio Ruiz is going to be talking about this data shortly. Uh, so that was really quite exciting that there's another example, two now, before really big earthquakes, magnitude eight plus earthquakes, of uh, some sort of geodetic transient that's going with the foreshocks. And um, it really begs a need that in both these cases, what made it interesting was the geodesy. But in both cases, there was something kind of wrong with the geodesy. And what we really needed in both cases was sort of the combination. We needed the instruments to be on the seafloor like they were in Tohoku, but to be operating continuously so that you could actually be sure of the anomaly like they were in Akike. And there's, so there's an instrumental need and a reason to do it now, given these magnitude eight earthquakes, to try to capture continuous seafloor geodesy. So how do you go about that? Well, I mean, those earthquakes already happened, so that's kind of water under the bridge. Um, it does seem like uh, trying to build out such instrumentation on any one fault segment that you might expect an earthquake on would probably be unwise. 
um, that would probably put us back into a park field type scenario where we're gambling on one segment for a very long time. Uh, I think most investors prefer a portfolio approach. And um, so it, if you take a look at a map of the world of uh, various areas where there have been identified seismic gaps on the mega thrust on subduction zone and those uh, mega thrust uh, those ad prior identified seismic gap have not ruptured uh, um, in the last 50 years you end up with this map of gray areas and if you allow yourself to have 80, it's a pretty arbitrary number, but 80 white dots of which are meant to represent seafloor instrumentation, you could actually do a reasonable job covering all of them. So it's not a totally stupid idea to think about a portfolio of fault segments that are likely to go, if you did this, you would be, the statistics are such that you are very likely to get magnitude eight earthquakes, more than one within a 10 to 20 year interval. And actually answer the question whether or not those sorts of precursors that we saw for Ikike and Tohoku are generally seen. All right, well, the strategy I'm suggesting obviously is long-term continuous before, during, and after earthquake instrumentation. There's more than one reason to do such instrumentation. And another reason has to do with probably the other, in my opinion, really exciting dis seismological discovery of the 21st century, and that is episodic tremor and slip. Um, episodic tremor and slip was um, is this gradual slow motion earthquakes on the plate boundary that in some cases happened fairly regularly, quasi periodically, every 14 months in Cascadia. And again, our leaning on the geodetic revolution to be able to be detected. And uh, there, the importance of episodic tremor and slip in this story is that, that uh, the existence of such slow motion earthquakes tells us that we have a much richer uh, uh, suite of behavior over the earthquake cycle than previously thought. And it's hard not to extrapolate that these slow slip events that we're seeing before earthquakes might have something to do with the slow slip events that we see in other places in between earthquakes and really what we need to be doing is stitching together the entire earthquake cycle over its full bandwidth. All right, clearly I'm excited about that idea, but, but let's not get carried away here. Uh, there are certainly migratory earthquake sequences that have not culminated in magnitude eight earthquakes. Um, I put a volcanologist hat on it for a moment here. I might call this unrest, what a volcanologist would call it, that you have uh, earthquakes moving and uh, that look, you know, not that different from the other ones here. This is a 1997 example that did not immediately end up in a magnitude eight earthquake. So there is a physical and question there about what's different and why do some of them do this and some of them don't. And it's also worth pointing out that not every earthquake has an observable foreshock. I have purposely used a somewhat historic figure for this point, um, as, as uh, difficult to read as it is. Uh, this is a figure of the Northridge earthquake uh, where this is a spectrogram actually, and the x-axis is time. And when, uh, I think basically all you need to know is that when it's blacked out here, that means there's lots of seismic energy, so lots of earthquakes. And the point of this figure is that times before the Northridge range, there's no black, there's no foreshocks. Um, this figure comes from the last time the National Academies um, endeavored to discuss earthquake prediction. 
which was 1996, um, and uh, which, as I, from reading the report, appears to be a fairly sober reading. Um, I'd, uh, and so it's um, worth realizing that uh, at least, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to see four shots probably before every single earthquake, and that that's an important open physical question. What distinguishes? Are there different flavors of earthquakes? Are there those that have four shocks and those that don't, and why is that? But of course, a lot has happened since 1996. Uh, quite a lot has happened since 1996, which is why we're bothering to have this discussion again. In 1996, we didn't know about episodic tremor and flip. In 1996, we hadn't had two magnitude eight earthquakes with observable precursors. We hadn't had the space geodesy revolution. And more, we also hadn't had the machine learning revolution. Um, and what computational methods can do for us today is um, allow us to dive deeper into seismograms and actually we're finding a lot more foreshocks than we used to. Uh, this is uh, an example drawn just from a couple weeks ago of Zach Ross's paper in Science where he improved the Southern California catalog through a template matching approach. And um, here was the previous Southern California catalog for a particular set of events in the Brawley seismic zone on the southern end of the San Andreas, which had a 5.3 to 5.4. And here is the improved catalog. And what's most notable of this example of the improved catalog is how many more foreshocks you see. And, and, this is, and he gets there by driving the completeness of the catalog down to magnitude 0.3. In other words, measuring really, really, really little earthquakes. And this is an important point. Really, really little earthquakes are an important part of the story of how to study precursors of really, really big earthquakes. It's that uh, they are the glue that stitch things together. They are where all our statistics come from because little earthquakes are so much more abundant. And we need statistics in order to look at rate changes. So instrumentally, observationally, we really need to measure small earthquakes in addition to the geodesy, and we need to really invest in our regional networks to do that. And we also need to be, get offshore and be able to measure small earthquakes offshore. OK, those are all some strategies on studying precursors kind of passively. There's a radically different strategy you could take on studying earthquake precursors. And it's kind of motivated by the fact I cheated here. Did anybody catch my cheat? This is not a normal earthquake sequence. Anybody read Zach's paper? No? OK. Uh, I, my cheat here is that uh, this is actually a sequence that's thought to be caused by injection in a geothermal plant um, in the Brawley seismic zone. Um, it's an example of induced seismic, human induced seismicity. And um, and so that really does motivate us to think about maybe we could study four shocks by you know pretending we're like real physicists and can do controlled experiments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's not surprising to me and good to hear. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, there's a lot of interesting, I'm going to try not to go the tangent because I want to go to volcanoes, but I can, uh, four shocks in Southern California are in some sense more abundant than they should be based on the aftershocks. And it's, um, so, uh, okay, an alternative strategy would be to actually try to capitalize on the fact that we see these sequences when water is injected and to try to do active controlled experiments. Now, there are reasons to believe that the 
earthquake sequences that humans make may be different than those that are forced by natural plates. Nonetheless, we do see foreshocks, we do see swarm behavior, and you know, you had the advantage of being able to do a controlled experiment where you know the forcing. And there was a, what I thought was a fairly beautiful paper by uh, Bhattacharya and Vyaska, also in science a couple weeks ago, uh, where they analyzed some data previously collected by E. Pugliami and co-workers, where they did an active injection experiment, and, un and somewhat surprisingly, what Patricia Vieska showed is the mechanism of triggering this four shocks and the ultimate earthquake sequence is not just the poor fluid getting on the fault and creating immediate failure sort of over, um, uh, by just decreasing the effect of stress, sort of the way that we normally think induced seismicity works, but actually created this aseismic slip pulse. And so there's an extra process in there. And when you do these active experiments, I think that's what they give you, is this ability to actually pull apart extra processes that you might not otherwise know about and that are pretty hard to get at through passive observation. Okay, earthquakes recap. Um, that so what i've said thus far is four shocks exist and are common we knew that um there are some open questions their physical origin cascade versus slow slip distinguishing features of unrest versus four shock distinguishing features of main shocks that are preceded by four shocks i don't have a good word for that main shock preceded by four shock versus isolated main shocks um Morgan, do you have a good word for that? <laughs> you don't think Northridge had, you think Northridge had a four shock? <gasps> okay. But uh, why well, it's an open question. Um, and, but those, and, so those questions are not new questions, but there's observations and there's data that's new and that we're in a very different place in approaching those questions than we were 10 years ago. Uh, we have these improved seismic records that are showing more common foreshocks, maybe 75% as Roland pointed out. 70 or 75? Okay. Uh, we, and I, I want to emphasize that a huge part piece of this is the space-based geodesy revolution that shows that these slow slips accompany these foreshocks in some places and also episodically on faults. And, and we have at least two good examples of magnitude eight plus earthquakes with both slip and four shocks. So that's, that's radical. And so the strategies I'm suggesting for getting further along the, um, on earthquake precursors, because I don't think I need to argue that that's an important problem. We're all on board with that, right? Um, is that we could use long-term continuous geodesy to high, and combined with high resolution seismic networks, particularly in subduction zones where we've seen these sorts of phenomena before, and, and or an active experiment. All right, here's a different question. And we currently predict eruptions. Mostly, yes. You guys are much more optimistic on this one, right? Are you going to give me a yes question mark? Uh, did I capture it? All right. I think most people think, most people in the field at least, think that we do a better job predicting eruptions than we do earthquakes. It's not considered such a buddy, crack potty kind of conversation. Um, well, is that really true? I find this a totally fascinating study. This is a paper by Winston et al. in the Journal of Applied Volcanology, which is basically a metadata study uh, that asks, how often do we get it right? So this is taking the point of view of an eruption that happens. How often do we uh, have either a timely um, a uh, prediction or nearly timely or maybe a little bit early, those are like the green or yellow, or totally miss it, or too late a prediction. This is kind of a sobering figure. Apparently, even though we all think we can predict eruptions, 
were messing it up almost 80% of the time. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, I think the disaggregation of this data is really what tells an, an interesting tale. Uh, uh, what Winston and coworkers did was then break up these alerts by what instrumentation is available at the volcano. And not surprising, and they have actual definitions in the paper of what these different kinds of levels of monitoring mean. Um, but not surprisingly, as monitoring gets better, good for them is having six seismometers within 20 kilometers of the vent or six continuous GPS or uh, continuous gas monitoring. That's their definition of good. Once you get to the good level, you're doing much better than, well, when you have no instruments on the ground. Well, that, that's perhaps not surprising, but it's telling us that we're not having good instruments on the ground on an awful lot of volcanoes, and therefore the idea that we are successfully predicting eruptions is somewhat erroneous. Um, even for the ones that have the good or the research grade, notice, by the way, it's only about 50%. Uh, so what's up with that? Does that? Is that that we actually should have even better instruments and then we would do even better? Or are there physical distinctions, just like there might be some physical distinction in earthquakes that do or don't have uh, precursory behavior? Now, the idea that there are different kinds of volcanoes, I think, is much more generally accepted than the idea there are different kinds of earthquakes. And so um, it's clear from this analysis that there is an observational need if we want to talk seriously about uh, eruption prediction, which is to have good by this definition or better networks. But we should probably go further than that. We should probably also ask the question, what physical, under what physical conditions are volcanoes predictable? And you get a little bit of a window into what's going on by looking at uh, uh, eruptions that do have, at least in hindsight, some precursory behavior uh, that lasts some duration prior to the eruption. Uh, the, uh, we'll call that run-up time, is the duration of the precursory unrest. And this is a study I did with Luigi Passarelli, and we defined unrest as uh, run-up time as simply the time that somebody some, near the volcano said that something unusual is happening. Usually it increases in seismicity level. Um, that was the best we could do because of the lack of generally quantifiable databases on these sorts of uh, measurements, and we'll return to that issue. Um, and, and, proposed and we also looked at um, this run-up time then as a function of the time since the last eruption and um, also the composition of the volcano. Um, result through day site. And it's, it's pretty sloppy, but there are some trends here uh, that the uh, more mafic systems are having shorter, in general, precursory times. Um, and they're erupting also more frequently. These are, this is a data set that's dominated by the open volcano system. And those have very short precursors. And uh, they are um, likely to be missed. In fact, a more comprehensive study at a, of the Alaskan Volcano Observatory found that they got only 9% of their open systems right. They were able to successfully predict. Whereas uh, predictions in general are much more successful in the closed systems, which are usually correlated with the um, high silica systems and which have longer repose times. So there are physical conditions that are in fact distinct and worth studying and disaggregating um, 
both for the point of view of understanding the mechanisms of eruption and for understanding when we should be answering the question, yes, we can predict eruptions, and when we should be answering, no, you're on your own. Okay, what about the other question that I keep asking, which is how often does unrest lead to eruptions? Again, this is a more generally accepted question in uh, volcanology, uh, but this is totally analogous to the earthquake question. When, how often do you get swarms that do not culminate in a main shock? Um, and uh, the answer to this is just unsatisfactory. Um, I was digging around for something and Sarah Ogborn was kind enough to send me her in prep figure um, of trying to compile um, unrest and percent by various definitions of unrest and how often that led to an eruption. And so she's got a bunch of different definitions of unrest listed here from various studies. Again, it's a metadata study. Um, and I think one of the things that jumps out at you from this is that there is no uniform definition of unrest for volcanoes. They're really pretty complicated systems. There isn't one thing to look at, not just looking at four shocks. There's earthquakes, there's geodesy, there's um, various kinds of earthquakes, there are gas measurements. There's a lot of different stuff that you might choose to look at and you'll end up with different definition of unrest and there is no consensus on what is the best definition of unrest that is most likely to yield results. And I think a lot of that has to do with a data management problem and a data facing problem. And I know that's a fairly unglamorous thing to say, but the only way to create such a figure and to create such um, a quantitative assessment of our predictive capability right now is to sit down and read a lot of bulletins of reports and a lot of prose of papers and try to stitch together a story. And what is needed is a much more comprehensive databasing and data management capability um, effort. All right, fortunately, I'm almost done. Um, so, uh, what I would suggest to make progress on Earth on eruption prediction is not that different than what I would suggest to make progress on earthquake precursors, which is that we need uniform instrumentation, uniform data management, publicly served data, and good level of network, or better, over a suite of volcanoes. And again, a portfolio approach is highly desirable because not every volcano behaves the same way. And we really need to understand comparative volcanology, I think, can I say it? Is Michael gonna get angry at me? I think comparative volcanology is in its infancy. And that we, because we haven't had these sorts of resources, and we're making progress. I'm citing papers that have happened in just the last few years, and we're getting somewhere, but we're, we're just beginning to because we're only beginning to get uniform data sets. So to recap, uh, for the volcanoes, we have open questions that are analogous to the earthquake open questions. We again have some things that are very new that are happening in the volcanology field, these higher quality multi-parameter networks and um, sufficient examples to do comparative volcanology so we can begin to build um, a suite of 100 volcanic eruptions to compare. It's not the million earthquakes in Zach Ross's databases, but it's something at least you can start to do statistics. Um, and that what we really need is long-term good networks and data management and dissemination. So, that is what I've suggested with an emphasis of passive monitoring on a portfolio of sites in both cases. Um, and I will stop there, and are there any questions? So...
You can't talk from the board quietly. Yeah. Okay, talk on. So, um, going back to earthquakes, you mentioned the number of observations that were not possible before uh, that could mm -hmm. be useful now. You didn't mention uh, repeating micro earthquakes. You know, I should have. <laughs> Mea culpa. Uh, I guess uh, repeating micro earthquakes we have known about for quite some time. I don't think we appreciated how prevalent they were. And they are in some way, in my mind, if I can make a little bit of an excuse, is they are part of what we get out of really investing in studying small earthquakes and investing in regional networks. But yes, they're important. Cindy. Yeah, well, just in the, the, the case you made in, in the table suggesting that we weren't very good at predicting uh, volcanic eruptions and that saying that we had such a diverse or heterogeneous catalog and in information mm -hmm. and not not um, not complete in any way and haven't you in a way said that we should go back and reevaluate using machine learning and other uh, re-extracting a lot of the uh, earlier earthquakes as well and systematically reanalyze for shock statistics and look at and also repeating earthquakes um, using our uh, the better tools that we have available to us now yes. including legacy data perhaps in cases ah that's no. where you're going no it isn't no, no, I, just added that <laughs> I think legacy data no, is no, no, important no. for this problem because no actually, uh, that because you need to get over a whole earthquake cycle and legacy data is a critical piece of that yeah, it wasn't specific to legacy. It was more just to comment about potential for extracting out more information by reanalyzing and building a systematic cap. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I think the difference in just quantity of data available in the earthquake problem in terms of bites and the volcano problem, and not quantity of data that exists, but quantity of data available is quite stark when you start asking these questions. Oh, yeah. You know, I was putting up bar graphs with 10 events for the eruption problem and a million events for the earthquake problem. And I think that's where we should be putting some effort. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned monitoring 80 volcanoes, or sorry, subduction zones for with seafloor geodesy. So what volcanoes is, what, too. In volcanoes as well, but in terms of the seafloor geodesy aspect, what does that, like, what does that entail? What is required? Is pressure gauges on the seafloor, what, like, what, do you need just a vertical measurement? Do you need vertical and horizontal? What's required? Okay, I'm going to defer, Jeff is practically jumping out of his seat there. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question, what is the threshold for slip? Okay, um, I am going to defer certainly on the instrumentation issue to people who do instrumentation. What I can tell you a little bit about is what needs to be recorded in order to actually see what is important and then you guys go figure out what the right instrumentation to make that happen is. Um, I think we need some centimeter resolution, um, and perhaps people, later speakers today, will clarify how much sub centimeter is necessary. Um, the, uh, we need, it definitely needs to be continuous because otherwise you don't, you have this baseline problem, it can't be campaign mode, so it either needs to be cabled or you need a data meal solution like a wave glider or something. And it needs to be under the water. It needs to be near the, and those are the three big things. And, it, and whatever technology you choose to do that meets those specs is fine with me. I'm just interested in the answer. That means you need a cable system. We'll, we'll talk about that in the next panel. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, let's move to the next. Yeah, let's wait yeah, until we get I'm, to I'm the next. I'm going to defer to you guys to give me what the answer is there. So we're also out of time. So that's okay. another reason to move. Thank you, Emily. Let's thank Emily uh, one more time.